and Benazir had invited me to come and stay with her along with another friend. She loved having her friends from Oxford to come and stay in Pakistan. And um, summer of 77, she said, you know, come and stay and uh, we can do this, we can go to Gilgit, we can, you, you know, you can understand more about Pakistan. But then of course, politics intervened and real life intervened. And very soon as all of you in Pakistan will know, uh, within days, literally of her return, having finished Oxford, um, she just had her 24th birthday party. Uh, the military coup took place. And then suddenly you get, again, I feel it's, it is like a, a Shakespearean play because you get the sort of change of scene, the change of, of act, the drama. Um, and you all know the history. Her father was arrested, put on trial for conspiracy to murder and condemned to death. And it was at this point, I got the letter which really did change my, my life. Um, wherein she said, I don't know what your parents would think of you coming to a country governed by bayonets, but if you want to come, do come and write some articles. She was very keen that um, the international community should understand what was going on in Pakistan. And maybe Ertazaz will talk more about this because using the judicial system, the judicial trial, it sort of allayed people's fears that, you know, Bhutto was on trial, he would uh, um, have a trial, it would be fair and, uh, the outcome would be a just verdict, etc. And this is where I plunged in as a, as a very naive person to try and sit and write some articles and comprehend what was going on. And I think what I've tried to convey in the book um, is from my Western viewpoint, we were incredibly ignorant. You know, countries, as I say, we didn't have the same international communication that we've got now. We didn't have Facebook. We didn't have all the accoutrements we've now got to understand each other's countries. And I literally arrived um, because I thought I was going to a hot country in a short skirt and a t-shirt because I didn't know about dress. I hadn't, I hadn't understood any of that. And there had never been time with Benazir because we were busy with our Oxford lives. There was, it was a very rapid transformation. And so what I'm conveying in this book is, it's also a growing up book for myself and I think for Westerners and our Western understanding of an Islamic country. Um, and I hope I've portrayed that fairly because that's what I've wanted to do. I certainly had very little idea myself and I, I had to learn, but it was through the friendship with Benazir that I learned. And that's the other point that I, I hope I've conveyed is that she never put me sort of at a distance as a, as a foreigner, as a Ferengi. I lived in her home when I could. I mean, even at times when she was under house arrest, she kept me within and it was through her eyes and through her that I learned and I understood customs, manners, uh, the, 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 the sort of traditions. Even when she took me on, the, um, on her first political tour to the Northwest frontier, as it then was, to Kaibakatakhtunkwa. And I remember we, we got swept along in a crowd of people and she sort of whispered to me as, as we were just arriving at one place, it was 10 o'clock in the morning, but roast chicken was laid out and a whole spread of food. And she said to me, you must sample the food. You cannot not eat. It's, it would be insulting to the hospitality we're receiving. So little things like that. So I did, um, I grew up um, immensely during that year and our friendship uh, continued obviously through the bad times, which was the execution of her yeah. father. And then the terrible time um, when I didn't actually see her for five years, most of which she was under in, in, in prison or under house arrest. And so it's a journey for both of us. Um, obviously, as I say, she had um, you know, a lot going on in her life and I, I dipped in and out, but with the dipping in and out of actually seeing her, we were we were constantly in touch and um so it's it's also a tribute to her and to that friendship and one of the reasons i wanted to write it was because we both now have three adult children um they were teenagers at the time of her assassination but now they're they're obviously adults and um i you know to my children she was always auntie benazir i was always for, for her children you know the english aunt and i i felt i needed to leave that legacy so they'd understand what, what a friendship like this can do and, and what it was about against the backdrop of an extraordinary country's history.
I think that's that's an, that's a sort of a, a taster of what's in the book. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, there's a. I mean, that that clearly comes through in the book. And I mean, you know, the the children are present. The children are sort of there. It's it's obvious that you've got an audience in mind, and it's an important audience. Um, so the way we've kind of talked about doing this is, I want each of our speakers to have a chance to comment on the book and to probe it a little bit, to kind of push Victoria on aspects of the book that uh, maybe she skirted around or she avoided entirely uh, in, in, in the spirit of getting out as much of this friendship and this personality who's larger than life personality as possible. So we're gonna start with Professor Salima Hashmi, uh, hand over to you, your comments mm -hmm. on the book and any questions you might have for Victoria. Well, first of all, I'm gonna put the record straight. I did not know Benazir. I met her several times, um, you know, at different times of my life when she was a teenager and she was a politician and once when she was a prime minister, but I did not know her. And therefore I'm the outsider to this story. Um, but an, a very, very interested outsider because of course, as mentioned, um, she impacted the lives of all of us. Um, and our lives are intertwined with the story that Virginia, that uh, Victoria tells. Um, I mean, you know, the first part of it starts in this sort of, as she said, the salad days. So there's, you get an idea of a person, a young person, as <clears throat> she herself said, pampered and brought up and, you know, with a great deal of the world at her feet. And then that changes. And, you know, the story proceeds and one, Although one knows it as a Pakistan, you know the story, but the way that Virginia, that Victoria tells it, it kind of gives you these little insights, little vignettes, uh, which make you smile, which make you laugh, which you know. And as an artist, I would thoroughly love the fact that she was responsible for uh, the murals done by William Morris being, you know, uh, restored and the lighting done and so on. So there are these little things. Um, which make her a person, uh, quite distinct from how we knew her, which was a very different um, astronomy. Um, I know when reading the book, one is very aware of two things. One, the loyalty that the author has, and then the strong friendship. And both of these values, I think, are so much part of culture in our part of the world, I mean, of course, they're part of every society, but they're very intrinsic to the way that we read ourselves and other people. And in times of stress, both of these qualities, friendship and loyalty, become tremendously important. So the part of this story, which to me was, is the unknown part, which I was riveted by, is where Victoria had the ringside seat to the, to the courtroom, where the appeal against the death sentence was being heard in the Supreme Court. And that to me is a really amazing part of this book because as a Pakistani, we were not privy to these details. There was no photograph of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto from the moment that he went, he was arrested for um, the, the, the supposed crime for which um, he was sentenced. So we had no idea of actually what was happening. And I was delighted to find that she had done, she's done these little sketches <laughs> of the court. And they're so, I mean, they're so endearing because, you know, I suddenly see these sort of curious characters who were the judges and, you know, who were just names to us and one we had no idea. Of course, one read a kind of account uh, in the newspapers. But as you know, as you all know, the newspapers were heavily censored at the time. Um, so suddenly I get an insight into that part of that story that we knew nothing about. And she was literally had a, you know, a ringside street because she was sitting in the first row and she could see these people. Well, the next day they made sure that some fat policeman took those seats, so she was sort of pushed to the side. But then she had this uh, she got this wonderful little sketch she has made of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. And, you know, his profile, which is what she was 
was able to see from where she was sitting. And what was news to me was that she, with her touch typing, was the person who actually typed out pages and pages and pages of his rebuttal to the white paper, which was, you know, the, a saga of his crimes put out by Ziaul Um And those pages that she typed out and with Benazir's help, they were taken smuggled back uh, to Bhutto in prison where he corrected them and they came back again. I mean, it's an amazing story. For people who like Etazars who have been in, in prison know how difficult it is to get books, to get papers, to have access. The fact that these pages went in and then out, and then they formed the book that we are familiar with, which is called If I'm Assassinated, which was um, Bhutto's story. Uh, you know, which we, we, we which was smuggled into Pakistan post his hanging. So, um, you know, for anyone who is who has a sense of history, and of course we lived through that terrible time, uh, the 11 years of the dark oppressive regime of General Ziaul Haq, um, these, these insights that she has given us, these details that she has given us are really extraordinary. And I mean, there, there's so much more, but I mean, uh, you have the little bit flash of humor in which uh, Bhutto's comments, you know, when these two young women are working to get that story out, typing and getting it to the, that, you know, with two presidents of the Oxford Union helping me, you know, I should be able to get a good story together. So, you know, you have that flash of humor, which makes, which makes it so credible, the whole, the whole recounting of what happened, so very credible. Um, I think that there's so much that one could say about this book, but there are the moments which she recalls and which I remember were important to me, not only as a Pakistani, but as a woman. The image of the prime minister, a woman who is visibly pregnant, who is inspecting the troops. I mean, I'm sure it must have it must have rankled many, many people, including the ones who were in charge of the troops. But for me, that was a moment in which being a woman, being a would-be mother, and being a political leader, all of these things come together. And I remember that at that time, one was extremely proud because it changed one's perception of oneself as a Pakistani woman. And going back now to the memory of that, through this book is something that I found extremely valuable and it really moved me all over again. And of course, there's so much in which she has, because I must say she's been such a meticulous record keeper. Uh, the way that she has kept records of moments, of letters, um, of uh, she has been putting these things and noting them in her diary, that one feels that the, the immediacy of the moment. And that so many years later, uh, today in a very changed Pakistan, I think one, at least for me, having lived through all those years, um, it's been, it's really been a way of reevaluating um, Benazir's contribution and also um, looking at certain things that have not changed, that have made us, um, made us what we are today. Uh, I think that one of the things that um, really I, I totally forgotten like, for example, Benazir's defense of Jam Saki. Um, for to hear, you know, that recounted and to, to read about what Benazir said about what a revolution is, that it is, you know, when people take, have the courage to take what is there rightfully theirs, which has been denied to them. So for me, that is that's a kind of an insight into her thinking which I was not privy to before. And um, I think it rounds out a person 
um, who was, I mean, we knew her as a prime minister, we knew her as a person who made a great contribution in many ways, we knew her as a person who also um, was very disappointing in certain ways. Um, but I think her um, re recalling the moment in which she was so brutally cut down, I think there again you have um, the way that um, Victoria has, has recounted it, I think I, I live to again that moment of immense grief. And it was a nationwide grief. And I remembered how the hush that was there across Pakistan, even her fiercest opponents, I think felt a sense of profound loss. And it was followed by what? It was followed by something that I recognized. It was followed by an immense rage, uh, which uh, Victoria was far away, but she still, of course, knows about all of those um, riots. And, you know, when she talks about the UN Commission's uh, report and uh, really takes the Pakistani state to task, and they say, you know, how there was incompetence, there was possibly collusion, there was um, lack of transparency. I mean, all the things that we recognize in Pakistan. Um, so uh, I think this is a very important book. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful for all kinds of little things that she's put in, things like, you know, how Benazir gave her this plant and she said, you know, look after George. <laughs> It was, Gadi, it was a gardenia, and how George didn't flower after that, after that first summer. But after that, whenever uh, Victoria had a, a gardenia plant, it was called George. I mean, I love these little things that she's put in. Um, lots of funny stories, lots of, um, well, wistful stories also. Um, there's going to be a lot of discussion on this book. And, uh, and quite rightfully so, because people who hated Benazir and people who loved Benazir and people who were extremely curious about Benazir and people who felt, especially with young people today who didn't know her, um, they want to know what it was that they were denied um, by whoever. And I think that it's important that this story is read, that they themselves should be able to gauge uh, what, how Pakistan's history would have developed, uh, what kind of pathways uh, would have been there, and which were forever closed. So I think that in that sense, I'm tremendously, I mean, one could go on and on, remember recalling little bits of things that she put in. I mean, the moment in which um, uh, Bhutto's lawyer, Ulam Ali Mehman, died before her eyes of a heart attack at a critical moment, uh, the day before uh, the final uh, statement by the defense. I mean, there are moments like that in which you, you, you really absolutely, um, you know, taken by this book and you, you want to know more. And so, yeah, so that's it. I think people should read it, make up their own minds, but thank you. Thank you, Victoria. <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much. Yeah, that's... Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Victoria, is there anything that you would like to sort of respond immediately before we move to Mr. Etazaz Hassan? No, no, not really. I mean, I'm, I'm just thrilled, I suppose, for me, because as an author, you know, you write things and you're, you're not quite sure whether they're going to strike the right chord or strike the right right sort of nerve in, in what someone else interprets out of it. And I'm, I'm, I'm really moved actually, Salima, that you, you have picked out these little things, which, you know, I was thinking, I mean, I like about George the Gardenia, it just, you know, it was, that was what it was. And, you know, one might've thought, well, word count as an author, you know, shall I put that in, shall I, you know, hard story, journalist, da, da, da. But it, to me, it just was part, it, it had to go in. I mean, I, 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 it was those sort of little, little tiny things. And I think 
another one which I, I particularly liked actually was, again, Benazir was very generous. You know, she often would arrive with, with something and when I'd organized this supper party and I can see it because actually it took place in this room where I'm, I'm sitting of my old house. I mean, I refurbished it a bit, but very much in this angle with this light. And um, she brought me a little tiny box as a, as a present in thanks for um, organizing the, the supper party because the Oxford friends were a big thing. Every time she'd come, she'd want to see the Oxford friends, which again was, was her, um, you know, wanting to stay in touch and how important Oxford was for her. But she handed me this box and as she handed it to me, um, she was looking pleased, but at the same time, she looked hugely disappointed because I happened to be wearing a very small pair of pearl earrings. <laughs> And, and, and in the box was an identical pair of pearl earrings. And I, again, I mean, I could have not had that episode in because, you know, it's not really, it's not <laughs> germane to the story, but to me, it was germane to the story. But it was so typical of Benazir because she, she immediately had a response which was, you've got two daughters, well, now you've got two pairs of pearl earrings. <laughs> yeah, I love that, I love that. <laughs> so so, those, so I'm, I'm really glad if those little stories were, worth, you know, that you're endorsing what I hoped is that they were worth putting in because I think what you've expressed very, very um, uh, sort of clearly, uh, Salimi, is that, you know, there is Benazir, the politician. I suppose I was so lucky because I knew the other side that I can't almost understand what it's like not to know the other side. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've, I've not betrayed confidences, but at the same time, I've given a, a little portrait of these, these other aspects to her, which I just thought, well, you know, there is an element of humour too. There's, there's, yeah. there, was, there was laughter, there was fun, which was, you know, she did have a great sense of, of fun. So... Yeah. Thank you for that. And you know, I hope when others read the book, they'll have the same reaction which Salim has had because I've written it for all Pakistanis. I've written it for all her friends. It's not, it's my story and they're my memories. Others have got their memories, but I have written it for you all so that you should understand a bit more and the next generation who don't know and who won't know about her. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think there are actually there are a lot of moments in the book which are which are actually very funny, you know, which made me smile. Um, now, I'd like to hand over to a man who did know Benazir, the politician, um, and who comes at it from a slightly different angle. Mr. Etazaz Hassan, I wonder if you would provide us your own views, your own comments, reaction to the book. And again, I invite you to probe Victoria a little bit and then push her a little bit on what she might have said. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Thank you, uh, Victoria and Nader. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, especially with uh, Dr. Salima Hashmi. Uh, there, uh, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, whichever way you, you may look at it, the post-COVID new norm is going to wreck the airline industry because we might have uh, flown into London uh, to have this uh, uh, conference and many an airline is going to be hit hard by the hundreds and thousands of board meetings that are being held dispersed over large areas of the globe rather than uh, coming in together. But Victoria's book is a breath of fresh air. It's an amazing book. I couldn't drop it. I couldn't leave it uh, since it started. And uh, it, it makes Benazir come alive. Uh, she, she's like sitting in the, your drawing room in front of you. And, uh, and Victoria know her, knew her so well from the, uh, what she calls the elite Oxford Union days. And uh, there is, uh, but there is no elitism really that comes out of uh, or exudes from these two young girls. Uh, or ladies, Victoria and Benazir, uh, they're there at that time, you know, ignorant to the point of being innocent and innocent to the point of being ignorant about what's happening in the world and they really couldn't care much more than for a, a, a yellow MG uh, car, sports car, and of having coffee here and going to parties, uh, etc. But what later uh, uh, 
in, uh, inspired people about Benazir for many of more things than that. Uh, Victoria has covered a very large uh, aspect of uh, Benazir's career and life. Uh, there have some been some which since they have been, uh, she's not been privy to them. Uh, but then I, I, I just want to speak about them because behind this uh, continuing uh, uh, young, youthful, uh, Mills and Boone's reading, uh, postgraduate of Oxford, uh, is a very tough woman, is a very tough woman. As uh, one thing that uh, uh, Salima has pointed out is I think extremely uh, indicative of uh, the tough uh, character she had all was of delivering a child while being the prime minister of a country, and she has been the first to do that. I think uh, Arden, uh, Jacinda Arden has followed her in New Zealand, but uh, she was the first. It's, it was to, for it to have happened in a Western country would, would have been amazing. For it to have happened in a third world country was more so, and to have ha happened in a third world Muslim country was, uh, Un unthinkable, but she was her natural self. Her first child was delivered. Uh, actually, Ziaulak had miscalculated. Ziaulak and the army knew that she was uh, with child. They calculated that the delivery date would be in November. So they fixed the date of the elections in November. But uh, Begum Nusad Bhutto, the mother, uh, Benazir, uh, the, the, Begum Nusad Bhutto, the grandmother, Benazir, the mother, and Dr. Setna, a Parsi, a minority, uh, belonging to the Parsi minority. The three of them kept it so secret that the army was uh, wrong-footed. She delivered the she, Bilawal on uh, she delivered Bilawal on the twenty-first of September through a C-section, and imagine she was on a truck campaigning on the twenty-third evening. I was with her in Karachi. So she showed such sense of the strength of character and strength of uh, person. The pain must have been very physical, but she was strong. Not that, not only that, the way she dealt with the, uh, with the generals. Uh, I recall a meeting at the foreign office where uh, uh, two or three generals spoke and they criticized her government. They criticized us. I was the interior minister. They criticized us for being very soft on India and not uh, taking advantage of uh, certain uh, uh, options that had opened up for us uh, against India. Sabzada Yakub Khan, who had been Ziaulak's foreign minister, and we had inherited him, unfortunately. Uh, immediately after, the army chief, Aslam Beg, had spoken, got up and said, uh, Madam, uh, we go for, we move for lunch. Benazir didn't take a second in replying. She said, no, Sabzada Sahib. Everybody remained seated while I have something to say. She was not uh, expected to say something, but she said, while I have something to say. She went to the rostrum, everybody sat down, 
she said, spoke for about five minutes, but she concluded simply. She said, gentlemen, army chief, deputy army uh, chief or whosoever, uh, the commander 10 corps, the DGISI, will you please come to my office for tea at 6 p.m. Give me your plans and I will direct all the armed forces to act upon them. And we start today. They didn't have plans. They were totally uh, stripped. The Pakistan army, the generals, didn't have plans. They, they could have attacked India, but they wanted to throw the burden on the civilians. And only she could defend the civilians in such a manner. I recall also, you will uh, or recall or let me refresh your memory, the, the Soviet Union, the Soviet, the Pakistanis, the Afghans, the Americans, uh, perhaps other countries, they signed the Geneva Pact. The Geneva Pact was signed on the 10th of February, 1988. Under it, the Soviets agreed to withdraw the last Soviet soldier from Afghanistan on the 10th of February, 1989, exactly one year later. In between, in December, Bibi became the prime minister and a new cabinet was formed. Otherwise, the whole move of uh, uh, retreat and most of uh, uh, the actions that were required to implement the Geneva Accord were going on very smoothly. Now we became the government and we were a new government and within two months, we had to withdraw uh, the, the troops, uh, the, so the Soviet Union had to withdraw the troops. Now we wanted, before we could endorse the decision, we wanted briefings and more than one briefing. In the briefing, we realized that uh, uh, the army, Pakistan army, and the generals, and they were trying to keep it from us, but they had decided to occupy Afghanistan after the Soviets had left. The, initially, the first target was Jalalabad, then Kabul and uh, the Oxus, uh, Mazar Sharif and Oxus. We did not agree with that. And in smaller meetings, there used to be a, uh, uh, a kind of a argument or a discussion, to say the least, between the army chief Aslam Beg, who thought if India attacked, uh, Afghanistan on the other side would be our strategic depth, our strategic depth. Now, this is not an army that is uh, trained on guerrilla warfare principles. It's, uh, it's a static army virtually with static guns and uh, uh, to, uh, to fire with, but they thought of it as the strategic death. And they were going to play favorites with who to uh, support in Afghanistan. Our viewpoint was that the Soviets would not be withdrawing as meaning withdrawing, as meaning withdrawing. They would be leaving fortresses behind. Jalalabad would be a fortress. Kabul would be a fortress. Herat would be a fortress. Kandahar would be a fortress. Mazar Sharif would be a fortress. The land around it may not be well defended, but these were fortresses they were not going to leave. So we opposed it. Ultimately, we had the president against us, Ghulam Isa Khan, the army chief against us, Aslam Beg, the DGISI against us, uh, Hamid Gul, the, uh, the foreign minister, our foreign minister, uh, supporting them that we would take over uh, Afghanistan after uh, when there's a vacuum. 
we kept insisting there wasn't going to be a vacuum. But then we realized that the, they were winning over the parliamentarians, our colleagues, the ultimate sovereign. And we would have, uh, we could do nothing if the sovereign wanted to withdraw to chase them up. So we had a meeting, an in-camera meeting, in 1989 January, uh, 14 days before the Jalalabad timeline deadline of 10th of February 1989, and there uh, the generals and uh, our civilian officials, they addressed and made out their case. But, you know, we were in a very small uh, majority in the, we weren't even in a majority, we were a, a coalition uh, whereby we had formed the government. Otherwise, we had only three members in the Senate. The Senate had been packed by Ziaulak until he died in the air crash. It had been packed by Ziaulak and we had three seats in the Senate, three senators out of uh, 100 uh, total senators. So this we were, we were in a precarious situation. When we asked, uh, when uh, the generals and uh, uh, when particularly Hamid Gul addressed the gathering, he had fire in his eyes. And he said, one month Jalalabad, third month uh, Kabul, six month, and we are under the uh, Oxus, on the banks of the Oxus, and we've taken over Afghanistan. This was a kind of a neo imperialism. And she and I were sitting together. And she said, What do we do? I said, We have to let them go because the majority, overwhelming majority of the uh, parliament has said that it would be criminal not to occupy Afghanistan when we had the opportunity. So we went and discussed it and we finally indicated to the president that we would uh, fall in line and allow keeping our reservations putting it down in writing, we, we put a paper down in writing that this would be a failure. She insisted that this be put on record. So we put it down on record. What happened was exactly what we had said. The Jalalabad operation was a total failure. Dead bodies started coming back. And ultimately the Pakistan army had to call it off. Now only she could, while she was soft and uh, had a sense of humor, and there are so many lovely uh, endearing stories about her in uh, the fragrance of tears, uh, some stories that is the other side of her, if she's facing East, uh, the Western side of her is our, our steel, our forged iron. And she was uh, uh, very, uh, in, in, in one other story, I'll, I'll just uh, try to rush it through. Uh, Rushdie's book was published. There were riots. In the riots in Pakistan, seven people died by police firing on the main uh, blue area road, which is the main highway of Islamabad. She was in China. I was looking after uh, the law and order and mainly the business of the state as the interior minister and most of it was my responsibility. She came back on a time. I asked her whether she wanted to come back early. She said no. Uh, she, her, her, her words were, it's Raz, you do not uh, cut, a, a, a cut short a, a visit to China or to America or to Russia or to India or to Great Britain and maybe uh, uh, Paris. So I'll come 
and I'm sure you can manage. She came back. We had a meeting at the airport. At the airport, uh, she asked, she said, who's responsible? I said, I. She said, no, 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 I don't want you, me, me, mean you. I mean, who ordered the firing? I said, I did. She said, no, I, finally she got so frustrated. She said, it's that I don't want to lose you. But I want to know, I, I think action should be taken. I said, then action should be taken against me. She said, uh, that is the, uh, what I want to avoid. I said, then let's, I have already requested for a judicial inquiry by a high court judge of the Lahore High Court. And he will come up with the findings. If it's against me, I'll go. If it's against anybody else, uh, he'll go. The judicial firing, a judicial inquiry was in fact uh, concluded in our favor and uh, uh, it, it held the miscreants responsible for the action. There are other such stories, many others that come to mind like uh, uh, the one on, uh, against the MQM and uh, uh, the action in Pakakila in Hyderabad uh, uh, like her uh, taking a strong position on military courts in Hyderabad. The army insisted on setting up military courts in Hyderabad. She said no. And I was, a, I was mainly the person uh, who had to speak to the army. She presided over the meeting. Uh, she did say, ask me, what's your opinion? We took a position that we cannot have military courts under a civilian rule and not uh, us. We had been fighting military courts. We resisted military courts. And it was abhor abhorrent, according to our uh, thinking, to have military courts trying civilians. Uh, so there was, there was these elements also. But I don't think that these necessarily, this is because of the discussion we are doing, these necessarily distract from the fragrance of tears. Because the fragrance of tears somehow in fact, I am, uh, I must correct myself. Somehow, uh, people, more people believe that she was the kind of draconian ruler that my account, my brief account today, uh, may have, uh, may give the impression of. Less of them think of her as a humane humanitarian, loving, tearful at times, smiling, uh, happy uh, to receive a flower, uh, uh, the soft Benazir. So I think this fragrance of tears is actually uh, the, the filling up that gap and uh, doing more justice to her than stories like the ones that I have recounted, but I've recounted them only because I, I feel that the other part of her, her character as a decisive, as a leader, as a person who was not afraid to take on the high and the mighty and, uh, and that is the one they feared and they eliminated. They did not eliminate uh, uh, the Oxford uh, girl. They eliminated the prime minister who wanted to be in charge and who, who knew what she was doing and who wanted uh, peace in the region. Uh, I think uh, Victoria very aptly says uh, how different might have be, might it have been, not only for uh, South Asia but for the world, had Benazir and Rajiv Gandhi been able to uh, put things right together? I think it's a wonderful contribution. I'm very grateful to Victoria because I've seen both sides of her. I've seen her uh, cry at uh, not being able to deliver 
piped gas to the kitchens of uh, rural areas. I, I've seen her cry. And I've seen her face her generals strongly with determination. So she has, uh, she had that book. I, I marvel at the leaders today and marvel at the society who uh, start believing in leaders who run out of the country and from out of the country they, uh, 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 they criticize uh, the generals. She did it while she was here and fearlessly. And that I think together with Benazir, she would be incomplete without uh, the fragrance of tears and Victoria's book. Thank you. I think that's a, that's a really fascinating response to it because you know when I read the book, I thought this is a brilliant book to give to students as a kind of introduction to Pakistan. Through this relationship, we see the politics of Pakistan, the culture of Pakistan. And actually what you've done, Mr. Etazaz, is, is just bring us back to this hard as nails, tough politician who, who had an impact on the country um, through all of these things that are probably uh, better known to political scientists. Um, Victoria, I'd like to hand it back to you. Uh, there's a lot there that you might respond to. Um, can I just say to the audience, I am struggling to keep up with the comments on Facebook I haven't yet seen a question. What I'm seeing is lots and lots and lots of comments saying, great book, Victoria, can't wait to read it. Congratulations. Uh, Bibi Shahid was a hero. So there's full of that, but no actual questions. So we may not get to questions from the audience, but if you do have them, please write them in the Facebook chat, uh, chat section. And Victoria, please over to you, uh, your response, your thoughts. Well, thank you, Etazaz. I mean, I, I actually, uh, my, my sub thought is I hope you're writing your memoir as, as well, <laughs> of Benazir, because I think we need to have everything you've said on, on the record as well. Uh, I think what, what I find, and of course, you know, I am aware of, of, of that aspect as, as well, um, but I wasn't writing on her so much as you realize as, as a politician. But I think the, the characteristic, and again, it was, it, it, one didn't see it so much. It was maybe there in, in Oxford because she was, you know, particularly when she went to Harvard, she was very young. She had to be resourceful. And I think resourcefulness um, was at Harvard and it was at Oxford as making do, fitting in. And then you got the courage which began during this terrible year of 78, 79, when the, the mantle, so to speak, the political mantle fell on her shoulders because everybody was under arrest. Her mother was under arrest. Well, her, her father's political colleagues were under arrest. And so in a way, it's the prelude to what then followed that steely determination and that extraordinary courage she had. And I, as a woman, I agree, and I'm very much aware of the um, uh, Extra extraordinary achievement of being pregnant. I and mean, on both occasions, I mean, even the third occasion had its issues because she had to come to London. She had to have a, an operation as well. But the first and second pregnancies and understanding a Muslim country as I do now, as I did not initially, um, I think it, it was quite extraordinary. And I think what I've actually put in the book, we in the West didn't understand that achievement. And it was very much, you know, when she became prime minister, everyone thought, oh, Pakistan's got a female prime minister. We've got Margaret Thatcher. Pakistan's got Benazir Bhutto. They had no idea of what that signified. And Salima, I wanted also to pick up on your point, because one of the things I did was actually make a, a program on women in Pakistan um, uh, during her first premiership and the impact that she had had um, on women in Pakistan. And it was exactly, I find your comment echoed in others I interviewed. And I remember when I spoke to Asma Jahangir about it, um, she, she said, yes, you know, she's prime minister. And so it gave us this sense of lifting the glass ceiling for us that we could achieve things in our own professions. Obviously it would take time, but it did lift that glass ceiling. And I think this is something which is sort of underestimated uh, particularly in the Western world. And that's 
also what I was was writing for, I think, was to to show you know my Western friends, my Western colleagues, how difficult it was for her uh, in operating in the conditions she was it operating, both as a woman and indeed in you know what is inevitably described as a turbulent society. Um, and so, you know, I'm again gratified by Ertezaz's comments and putting my my memory, my reflections in in the political context because it's all part and parcel of the woman we knew as as Benazir Bhutto, and one can only but admire her because she certainly never shirked from adversity and she never. Um, uh, sort of had no courage. I mean, you ca can't possibly say she was not a woman of, of courage. And I think that is part of her legacy as well. You know, she could have had an easier life and just stayed back in the West and not, not gone back, but it was that conviction. And I think one of the greatest sadnesses, and of course it does have the, the tragic ending is, and I've said this before in other forums is that Given her death aged 54, which we now consider, you know, um, Mr. Bhutto, was, uh, her father's also Kali Bhutto was, was um, uh, 51 um, in 1979. Um, she was 54, it's, it's young, she was in her prime. And I think for you in Pakistan, what I feel is tragic is that we'll never know what she might have achieved in her prime because she was young first time round, the, there were difficulties, etc. But I think this time, and I, I was, you know, obviously watching her and very much uh, um, uh, following her, her progress, um, of why she went back and what she wanted to achieve. And um, that, I think that assassination just, it, it cut short. It was like, I felt they'd felled a tree that had become mature. And then what we were faced with was, was starting again with, with young Blawal, you know, a 19 year old boy at that time. Um, and I think, I think it is a tragedy for Pakistan. As I say, whatever one thinks of her political um, convictions, it, it's an assassination inevitably upsets the natural order. And I think that is one of the tragedies and it's why it, it does have um, a sad ending and indeed a sad title. And for those of you who don't already know the fragrance of tears, it's a quotation from Shah Abdel Latif and um, the great Cindy poet who she introduced me to on in that early summer of 78. I had of course never heard of Shah Abdul Latif, but she loved his poetry. And um, so I thought having a poetic artistic title was much nicer than just a, a generic title. And that's why I, I wanted I do to the fragrance of tears. Yeah. Yeah. So, May I, uh, uh, Stephen, add, uh an episode, another little episode. On the 11th of June, 1986, the Newsweek published a, an interview by, uh, of Ziaul Haq. Uh, it was a question, answer, question, answer. And in giving an answer, Ziaul Haq imputed that she was a Soviet agent. <laughs> and the Soviets were backing her up. Oh. 11th of June, 1986. Uh, I was in law. She rang me up and... after two months. Hadn't she? she just got. She went back yeah, on. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. It, uh, uh, in that excitement period, as yet, and uh, she uh, rang me up. I was in law, and she said, "Can you come over?" I said, "I'll come over." I went, and she said, uh, "Read this. Uh, I want to sue uh, Newsy." <laughs> I said, all right, uh, I'll go back to Lahore and I'll uh, send you a draft of the notice. And so I came back. This was the age of the teleprinter. <laughs> this was the age, the fastest means of uh, uh, communication was a teleprinter, no fax, no email. So I came back, I uh, made a, a, a notice, uh, drafted a notice, I sent to her by hand, uh, by air. Uh, she made some changes, sent it back. We su were suing, uh, uh, threatening to sue a Newsweek worth uh, 10,000, uh, 10 million dollars uh, for uh, uh, loss of reputation and for slander and for, uh, and 
the fact that this was he was a malicious person having uh, executed her father so i didn't hear anything on the first day on the second day also it went through without hearing anything and she kept ringing she rang me up thrice and said what if they don't take notice we we'll look very stupid what if they don't take notice no i couldn't say anything she was right if they didn't take notice we would look stupid late on the night on the second day a lady called diana daniels she was apparently the director and the head of the legal department of newsweek she rang me up and she said uh, uh have you issued this notice i said yes she said uh, do you know that you are fire going to be fighting uh, newsweek and you know our strength i said uh, we are aware of that uh, you are a very strong uh, party to contest in court uh, she said uh, well uh, uh, are you sure you want to go to court i said not if you settle she said we can't settle like this uh on these terms that you are saying this is too much i said but give me a figure she said uh, she laughed she said uh, with this kind of a uh, adventurism you can hardly be asking for a figure uh i i, I said uh, she said and no jury is going to give you uh, anything of this kind i said uh, miss daniel do you know my client she said no but are you have you heard of her yes i have uh, i said i challenge you to have any anyone you want in the 12 member jury and i won't challenge a single man but my client is a radcliffe Harvard Oxford Union president whose father has been brutally wrongly murdered by a military dictator in a third world a uh, third world banana republic and who's gone back to fight with that uh, uh with that dictator when she steps in the witness box with this background and this fight ahead of her i give you all the 12 jury members remember that and remember also that she is beautiful <laughs> you know what she said she said to me uh give me a couple of hours and i'll get back to you i in the meantime rang up bb in uh, karachi she said have they rang up have they rang up i told her exactly what i said she said then tell them uh, tell me uh, immediately after you spoken to them after she rang you up i said i will but what is the settlement she is going to say uh, um she is going to go to figure after all even if i have uh, under pressure so she said uh, uh, i'll take a breakfast with the editors and i'll talk the uh, amount myself i said fine i'll uh, put it to her if she so when diana daniels rang, uh, rang up again i gave her these both these and she said well we'll work it out i think we can work it out uh, what do you want in print i said i want a, an apology in the uh a a a a recrudescence from what you've alleged in the same space and she wants a photograph in newsweek of her and her crowds in lahore <laughs> she said i think we'll find this that photograph we'll send you a few copy copy options and then you can choose your option and we'll put it there and on the uh 18th of uh, june newsweek newsweek carried that she went and had her breakfast with the, uh, the editors and settled 
uh, an amount with them. So, uh, yeah, thank you. That sounds like, uh, Mr. Echazad, if I can say, that sounds you're a pretty good lawyer. You had a good client. It sounds like you're a pretty good, pretty tough negotiator yourself. Uh, I we've got a I got, her been... I got her acquitted in nine, and her husband in nine uh, indictments. <laughs> nine indictments. Yeah. So if I get in trouble, if you're available, I'll be I'll be calling you. <laughs> you you, <laughs> you come to like a... come come via Victoria. <laughs> I will come via Victoria. Absolutely. So we have a number of questions that have come in from Facebook. Uh, I I cannot possibly get through them all. But there's one that actually speaks directly to my own interest, Victoria, which I wonder if you could answer. Somebody has asked, what was Benazir Bhutto's views on dynastic politics? And the two sides of this, what were her views on dynastic politics? And one, did she prepare her son, Bilawal, to take over from her the way she was prepared by her father to actually assume the, the, the sort of mantle of control? Well, that's that's a very good question, actually, and it's it's one that you know it does need to be answered, and it it has sort of two parts to it. I mean, if you read the, um, I think it's the updated version of her biography, and this is something she also repeated to me quite often, but she's written it very beautifully in her her, her autobiography. I did not choose this life; it chose me, and I think that's very important because, again, as a historian, I will say we often have the ability to. Um, look at history retroactively and read things and signs which we like to find and, and like to you know fit our narrative but Benazir herself was not intending to go into politics she was um, going to go into Pakistan's foreign service before the military coup in 1977 and I actually still have in my archives an interview that she did which is headline no politics for the premier's daughter who became president in other words of the Oxford Union but of course, the void, and this is what she writes about quite a lot, um, that was left when her father was um, arrested and all, not only him, but all of her, his colleagues, really put her, thrust her into this position, aged still only 24 at the time. Um, and then, as, as we know, life gains a momentum. His uh, execution really cemented that role initially, and it was during the period that I was was um, obviously in Pakistan in 78, 79. Um, it was sort of hoped, I mean, one hoped for the best prepared for the worst at that time that he wouldn't actually uh, be executed and that he would um, be acquitted and he would return um, into politics. And then maybe she might have stepped back, but as that was not going to happen, um, she, obviously stepped in because the expectation was, and this is something which is very, I mean, actually I would say it's South Asian, but it's not unique to other countries. You have uh, political families, you have acting families, you have artistic families, you know, you do, you kind of follow in the pattern of potentially a business families. Um, so it, it really devolved on her, but not not I would say voluntarily, but she stepped up. Instead of saying, I can't do this, I'm going to do something else. She stepped up and accepted that challenge um, and that became her fate. But she did not expect um, her son necessarily to go into politics. Um, he, he had, he'd barely started university, he'd been one term. And I think this is where the narrative does change. Um, she at least had finished, she'd had two degrees, one from Harvard and one from Oxford when she went back to Pakistan, age 24. Bilawal had just started at Oxford one term when he was again thrust into this position. And I would rather say it's, you know, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, because if you don't step up to it, you know, you're not fulfilling the family mission, you're, you're deserting, you're opting for the easy life. Um, whereas if you do, then, oh, well, it's dynastic politics, etc. cetera. Um, I do remember one time about, I think it was about four years ago, I was asked a similar question actually to speak on dynasty at um, the Karachi Literature Festival. And um, I prepared my notes again on, in, online of, you know, acting families and political families, etc., and explaining, you know, why Benazir had gone into politics. Um, but I gave this throwaway remark, which I hadn't really prepared, but it sort of came off out of my mouth at, at, at sort of towards the end of my presentation. And I said, you know, if you want to stop 
dynasty in politics. You've got to stop assassinating your politicians. And that's really um, what the situation is. Had, had Benazir not been assassinated, you would not necessarily have had Bilawal in politics. Uh, he might have become a lawyer, he might have done anything else, but it's this leaving of a void, it's this premature removal um, that is so damaging to the development of a parliamentary process. Um, and so I think that's, that's my answer to, to the question. Yes, during the prison time, her father was preparing for the worst, uh, schooling her, talking to her, you know, and that's what's traditionally regarded as schooling her, that, that period of nine months uh, schooling that she had while he was still alive. Um, but had he not been executed, as I say, she might, she might have gone into the foreign office or, or done anything, but it is this premature removal um, and this huge expectation that you have to step into the void and fill the void that in a way um, creates this dynasty. Thank you. That's a, that's a very good comprehensive answer. We've got a question here, um, which really I think for Professor Salima and Victoria both, uh, it's, it's asking what was Benazir Bhutto's contribution to the women's movement, women's rights movement in Pakistan, and what might she have pushed for had she not been assassinated? Gosh, oh, Salima, do you want to go first with that one? Yeah, but, but yes, but, well, the thing is, you know, um, this is something that has come up, it came up during when she was alive, for example, you say, what does she do for women? Um, you know, she's not, she's not sort of addressing their issues specifically. And I, I felt that that's possible you can interpret that way because she did not take up, you know, specific issues. Uh, she was looking, I think, at, it may have been conscious she may have decided to you know, be the prime minister, not only of women of Pakistan, but for all citizens. That's one aspect. But the fact remains, as I said earlier, that by simply being who she was as the prime minister, conducting herself the way that she did, and having this, having this knowledge of what her presence meant, did in fact, you know, give women the idea that, okay, there's no stopping us. And there was a quantum leap during, you know, the period, because I don't forget, we'd had the most savage laws put in place during Zayal Haqsta. And then, you know, when that curtain went down and you had Benazir, my goodness, it was like, you know, the sky's the limit. And so simply by the fact of her being the prime minister, I think it altered. It altered the, the landscape, the mental landscape of women. And you're quite right. I mean, with Asma Jangi, who was you know, her friend, they very often did not see in you know, the same way politically. But on this issue, they were, they, were, they were pals. And I think that Asma understood very well what Benazir's contribution was. Um, you know, just very soon after, just two days later, I had an exhibition in my gallery and we, we paid a tribute to Benazir, you know, it was just two days after assassination. There was no light, there was load shedding, and I invited Asma to speak and she gave one of the most moving addresses. We just, it was by candlelight and we had lanterns, and we had a small audience. And she spoke of what it meant for women uh, to have a person who they could relate to, even though she, yes, she was um, from a different class, she was from a feudal family, uh, she, but they knew her struggle and they could, they could truly, truly feel, yes, it's possible for any woman in Pakistan now to fight and to, if she had the courage and to be heard. So yes, that was a game changer for women. And um, it, it led the way, paved the way for change of laws. She did not have the, uh, the in parliament, she didn't have the kind of majority to she turned back a lot of the, um, the, the laws, the Hadood laws. 
but um, nevertheless, I mean, they came to be, you know, dis in many ways discarded, or rather they were downplayed, but um, yeah, she was the antidote to Ziaul Haq's, um, you know, misogyny, I would say. Thank yeah. you. I mean, I mean, I, I think, you know, as I say, from, from my, my perspective and, and the Western perspective, again, I would reinforce that we had no idea of the difficulties under which she was operating. And I think uh, Salima's point that when she was a breath of fresh air when she came in and that, that fantastic photograph of her, which we all remember, dressed in her green shalwa kameez, taking the oath of office with her white dupatta. Um, there the was this feeling that the sky's the limit, but at the same time, there were these huge expectations somehow that she could wave a magic wand and everything could be perfect in the best of worlds. And I think the higher the expectations, the, the, the harder it is, in fact. And what I, I would love to do, just, just to remind us, because we don't have asthma with us anymore, but um, when I was writing my memoir, I got out my old tape, tapes, which I, all my interviews are on cassettes. And I, um, luckily I found a cassette player so I could play them to get the um, exact quotations. But this is what Asma said, um, which really reinforces what Salima has just said. Um, she said, this, there is a feeling amongst women in professions that they can now come to a position of power. Previously, it was not possible for a woman to think that she would be at the decision-making point in any field that she was in. Today, the feeling is there that if I do well, I can make it to the top. And I think that that is saying exactly what, what you're saying, Salima. Um, Victoria, uh, yeah. th th I think there's another aspect to it. Uh, what she contributed uh, is that that which comes and is considered in an ordinary woman in our society, perhaps as a matter of shame, perhaps something to hide, something that is not to be attributed to you, uh, something that is lowly. Uh, she did it. Mm. I, I think, uh, well, the t first of all, the three deliveries of children she did. First, during a, an election campaign. Second, uh, while a prime minister. A third, the third, while her husband is in jail. Now, uh, Pakistani women would shy or be shy of this. Take another matter. The first time she goes to North America, to the United States, when she addresses the joint houses also, she, she, the photograph that was on front pages of all newspapers, particularly the uh, uh, family-oriented southern states, was of her, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, coming down the steps of an airplane, carrying it. her own child, what we call, what we Stephen call, alti palti, which means one leg is behind her, uh, the mother, the other leg is in front of the mother, and the mother is holding the child up from the bottom. And she walked down the steps like a pendu, a village woman, a village Pakistani woman. Who would do that? She would have had her child with her nanny come uh, 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 half an hour after she'd left the airport. Yeah. She was not ashamed of anything, of being a woman. She was not afraid of being a woman. And yet she was tougher than men. Yeah. Now, another thing I'd like, a point I'd like to make is that she did absolutely love motherhood. Um, and and uh, I mean, obviously she had to have a nanny at certain points, but she, she absolutely adored those children. And I think that's one of the most heartbreaking aspects yeah. of the story. Um, yeah. she, and I, I think she and Asma had that in common. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. No, no, they did. They loved them. Um, anyway, we more questions. Uh, see, I don't want to, you know, digress. Uh, yes, we, have, we have a lot more questions. We can't get to. Uh, there's a there's a variety of them. I do encourage you later, Victoria, to have a look at the comments section because okay. uh, there are a lot of questions. Apart from anything else, there's several recommendations that this be turned into a, a television series or a film. Um, so I'll leave that up to you to negotiate with your publishers. Uh, but I have a question here, which is actually very personal. It's it's asking what advice did you give her before she returned in 2007? Did you give her advice? Did you say no? Don't do it. Um, it, I, that's, again, it's it's a it's actually a moving and emotional question because um, I. I did not say don't go back. I think some people did say don't go back. I knew she wanted to go back. Um, and I would not ever presume to um, suggest things that um, weren't appropriate for her. And I suppose perhaps that was something to do with our long friendship. It was, I, I understood its its progression. I mean, a friendship doesn't, it's not static. And I, I knew what the periods in pr uh, being prime minister were like. I knew what the dismissals meant for her. I knew what the period of exile meant. And this, it, everything had come to a, a sort of, in a way ahead that this is what she wanted to do. But I do um, have a vivid recollection and I've recounted it in, in the book of her standing in my kitchen and us talking about the dangers. And um, again, dangers that, you know, had, I think, become greater in Pakistan in that there were suicide bombings. As I say, when I first went to Pakistan in 78, we have to go back to no Kalashnikovs um, uh, kind of mentality. But now, you know, post 9-11, the suicide bombings and all, all the targetings that went on. And of course, Musharraf had been um, himself a subject of an assassination attempt. And I remember standing in the kitchen saying, you know, you will take care, won't you? Um, and she looked at me long and hard at that point. And she said, of course, um, but life and death are in God's hands. And I think this is what, again, it's another side of her courage, um, if you really want to think about it. She knew the risks. Of course, she, she didn't want uh, to die. And I think that's very important. I mean, uh, some people most uncharitably said afterwards, well, she wanted to go back because she wanted to become a martyr. and. Um, you know, that, that, that's the most appalling um, comment to make. Uh, she prepared for the worst, but hoped for the best, again, much like with her father. Um, but it, it, was, it was very, very dangerous. I think, um, I, personally, I, I cried, and I've, I've put this in the book, when I said goodbye to her um, for the last time after the first um, attack in October, um, uh, I'd stayed on in Pakistan for a week um, and I, I said goodbye to her and um, I, I was crying as I left. I, I left with her sister, sister Sunny, and we were both crying. And I think I had that terrible feeling that I wouldn't see her again. It was just all very much, very much on edge. Um, I then thought, well, maybe it's a rational fear. Maybe it'll be okay, et cetera. You know, as you get distanced, you're sitting, I was sitting at home in, in the UK, Christmas was coming, et cetera. Um, but yes, I mean, I think uh, it, it, was, it was part of her, uh, her destiny in a way. She, she had to go back. Um, I think it's tragic we can't actually um, say who, who assassinated her. And I think Ertazaz's point is the woman who was assassinated was the steely, courageous, um, formidable political opponent um, that certain people didn't want to have around. And that, that was the woman who was assassinated. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it's in, in, in your book, the way you frame it, you begin the book with that tragic ending. So we know from the outset that is overshadowing all of the happy moments in Oxford, all of the happy moments of friendly. That's that's how you start it. It's bookended with that tragedy begins and ends the book. And it it does make all of the lighter moments, the humor, the friendship, the love, it makes it very poignant. And and I think, you know, personally, when I read it, it makes me appreciate all of those moments in my own life because we don't know. You know, in this end, in this story, we know how it ends but we don't actually know how any of our stories are gonna end. 
So one of the, I think, I hope the take home message from your book is cherish those moments, cherish those friendships because they, you know, we really don't know. And in that case, um, I think it, it, it kind of a, a fairly brutal end. We have yeah, more or well, less I run think, out of time. Um, I, yeah, yeah. I would like, please. No, no, go ahead. You're the star, Victoria. No, no, I was, I was only going to say I, I agree. And I, I afterwards, uh, her assassination in, in, you know, December 2007, I look back on the meetings we had in 2007, because we, we met up quite frequently then. And, you know, who would have known those were the last meetings I was going to have, you know. But anyway, yes, let's, if there's time for one more question. Yes. Um, so the last question really is about the aftermath. Um, and, and, and it comes from, uh, the question is really to Mr. Etezaz. You, were, you are an extremely popular politician. Arguably, you were one of the most popular PPP leaders in the, in the uh, aftermath. In 2007, 2008, you were there at the uh, lawyers movement. Um, how might things have been different had you taken over as the leader of the People's Party? And, and do you think you might have to kind of for the Pierre Bouteau legacy more effectively than the leadership that did take over? I know it's a loaded question. Uh, it's a very loaded question. And uh, my answer is simple, actually. Uh, I think uh, the People's Party voter uh, would uh, uh, prefer uh, one of uh, uh, Benazir's own uh, children to me, and ultimately it is the voter who counts. It's, uh, it's a matter of arithmetics and uh, matter of numbers. And I have no problem in being in a party which remains to, to date with lots of my misgivings, despite lots of my misgivings, but remains the only uh, party which, is, which has a liberal uh, position on uh, a lot of things that uh, uh, in a country which is being strangled by religious dogma, uh, is a, a People's Party is a party that does not uh, uh, mix its politics with religion. That I can say is uh, uh, something that uh, is close to my heart. And something that uh, uh, even the founder of the uh, of Pakistan had said that religion shall have nothing to do with uh, the business of the state. Uh, I find only the Pakistan People's Party as a party uh, for all its faults. I'm not saying it's a perfect party. I'm not saying we are a perfect uh, 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 leadership. We are not saying that there are not enormous flaws in our, in, our, in our ranks. I admit all that, but when I come to discuss or to uh, actually compare political parties, other political parties, uh, particularly at the national canvas, all provinces and, and uh, Azad Kashmir, uh, I find the People's Party is the only party which does not lean on religion for its uh, uh, politics. Thank you. Okay, with that, I think we have more or less run out of time. Um, so I will say that the book is available at all good booksellers. Um, it's available online. You can pre-order it now. Uh, it's available to ship on the 15th of October. Um, if I could, I will give the last word to Victoria. Uh, let me thank you very much for taking the time to do this. I think this is hugely beneficial. I think when you read the comments on the Facebook, you will see how much this book is anticipated and how much people are desperate to read about this. But I, as I say, a very intimate, personal, touching relationship, which actually unleashes an awful lot about the politics and the culture of a fascinating place. So Victoria, can I give you the last word? Um, if you would like to, anything more you would like to say about this? Well, I, I'd just like to, to thank um, everybody, you, Stephen, um, Ertazaz, Salima, and again, of course, N uh, Nada and Sohela, who's been doing the technical side. And then I'd like to thank all my viewers and everybody who has commented and put questions in. And 
I would like to thank Pakistan in a way for welcoming me um, as, as, as sort of one of their own many times through, through my friendship with Benazir. So often I used to, to get to, uh, talked about when people would see me and they'd say, oh, you're Benazir's friend. I mean, she may not have realized it, but it was because I was Benazir's friend. I was given so, mu so much hospitality, so much love. And I hope people who read this book will see that I have written it from the heart. I've written it with as much uh, authenticity as I possibly can, um, given that I'm a historian as well. I don't like massaging the facts or altering uh, the things. Um, it's, it's written um, as, as I recorded it. And I'm glad I did keep a lot of, a lot of documentary uh, material because it does bring an immediacy. Even things I'd forgotten, I then found in, in my diaries and letters and um, uh, letters I'd written to my parents. So I would just like to thank everybody and, and really with, with Benazir and I think uh, even her critics, um, you know, to be very critical of somebody, you have to understand them and what enormous difficulties they were working under. And I think again, you know, the epitaph for Benazir, it is her huge courage and her huge humanity and, and her kindness and generosity of spirit, which I personally was able to witness. So thank you all and thank you for viewing and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. And on behalf of Pakistan University Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations and Bloomsbury Pakistan, thank all of our audience. Thank Professor Salima Hashmi, uh, Mr. Etazaz Hassan, and of course, Victoria Schofield for giving us the time and talking about a fascinating book. Thank you all. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.